today we're going to start going over the Vesper theory. So this has to do with the shapes of molecules. Okay, so we've been drawing loose dot structures and figuring out um, how atoms are bonded together in a molecule. And today we're going to start going over the shapes of molecules because the three-dimensional shape of a molecule is very important. When we look how a molecule reacts with other molecules, it will determine maybe which site will be most reactive. It also determines sometimes uh, what state of matter the shape of the water molecule, for example, is the reason why water is a, a liquid on Earth. If it were a different shape, it might be a gas instead always. So what we're going to be looking at are the number of bonding regions in a molecule, as well as the number of non-bonding regions in a molecule. And both of those play an important role in the shape of a molecule. So if you look at this picture here, we have carbon dioxide. This is a linear molecule, and it has two atoms bonded to the central atom. Sulfur dioxide has a very similar formula, but because of the number of non-bonding pairs, as we go over these, you'll see that that determines that this is a bent shape, um, whereas, like I said, carbon dioxide is, is a linear molecule. Same thing here, we have sulfur trioxide, nitrogen trifluoride and chlorine trifluoride. They each have three of the same atom bonded to the central atom, but they have very different shapes. And again, that has to do with the number of non-bonding pairs on the central atom, which you will see. So the things that determine the shape of a molecule are the electron pairs around the central atom. And it'll be important if they're non-bonding as opposed to bonding pairs. So electron pairs do repel each other. So electron pairs in a molecule do repel each other because those electron pairs all have negative charges and they do try to get as far apart from each other as they can. When we look at molecules, double and triple bonds count as a single area in the molecule where you have electron density. And you'll see what I mean by that when we start doing problems. So there's a theory called valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, or VSEPR. This I will call this VSEPR. This just means electron pairs in a molecule try to get as far apart from each other as they can to minimize the repulsion between the electron pairs. So here we have a molecule with two bonding regions off the central atom. And to get as far apart from each other as they can, they have like a 180 degree angle between them. And this causes the molecule to have a linear shape. So it's important, one way to think about this is to think about balloons. When you tie balloons together, balloons naturally will try to get as far apart from each other as they can. And it, I'm, I found pictures of balloons, which I hope will give this a better, give you a better idea of what's happening here. But if you look at two balloons, when they're blown up and we tie them together, they form that linear shape up here in the left-hand corner, upper left-hand corner. If we have three balloons and tie them together, we see that they make kind of a triangular shape here, and that's to get as far apart from each other as they can. If we have four balloons and tie them together, we see that they get, they get what we call a tetrahedral shape. So you imagine one is kind of sticking up and the other ones are pointing down. And then if we have... Um, if we have five balloons, if you tie them together, you would see that they would make this shape in the middle here, where you would have a balloon above and below a plane, and the balloons in the center are kind of making a triangular shape in the center. And if we have six balloons, we see that again, we have a balloon above and below a plane, but here the plane is a square shape. We have four balloons, each pointing to one corner of that plane. So 
electron pairs will do a similar thing to get as far apart from each other as they can, and we end up seeing very similar shapes to these. So the way we determine the molecular shape is we first draw a Lewis diagram, just like what you've been doing. So it's very important that you're spending the time in making sure you're using the appropriate number of electrons, that you're satisfying the octet rule, that you're making sure you don't have a situation where you have an expanded octet, and that you're also thinking of the exceptions like with boron, beryllium, and hydrogen. The next thing is you're going to do is you're going to count up the electron pairs on the central atom. And remember that double and triple bonds count as one pair. And we'll go through some examples so you can see. The shape is determined by the number of bonding pairs and the number of lone pairs. And the lone pairs we're going to be looking at will just be the ones on our central atom. So here, well, the reason why the bonding and non-bonding are important is that when you look at the, the bonding pairs, bonding electrons are really are being attracted to two different nuclei. So here we have a bond. The blue region are, is our electron cloud. This electron cloud is attracted to these two red nuclei on either side of that bond. So this restricts how those electrons can move between those two atoms. They are going to be hemmed in, you could think of, um, by these two nuclei. Now, if we have a non-bonding pair, this is only being attracted to one nucleus, a single nucleus. So it's the movement of those electrons in that non-bonding pair is much less restricted, and they can really spread out quite a bit. So what we see is that non-bonding pairs take up much more space than bonding pairs. What we also see is that if we have a molecule with only bonding pairs, bonding regions around the central atom, the angles that between the, um, the bonds are fairly small. So here we have carbon tetrahydride. We have four bonding regions. The angle between the bonds is about 109.5. Now, if we replace one of these bonds with a non-bonding pair, in the case of nitrogen trihydride, we see that, like this picture here on the right, that non-bonding pair takes up more space and squishes those, um, those bonds closer together, and it decreases the bond angle from 109.5 now to 107. If we replace another bonding region with a non-bonding region, in the case of water, now we have two non-bonding regions and two bonding regions. This again squishes those bonds closer together and decreases the angle once again from 107 to 104.5. So the more bonding regions, I mean, excuse me, the more non-bonding regions we have in an atom, the smaller the, the um, angles will be between the, the bonds. So we're going to be using something called the Vesper notation. So I want you to just write this down, and we're going to practice. Um, shortly with some problems from your um, your Lewis dot structure worksheet with all the boxes. So this is known as ABN notation, where A is your central atom, B is the number of atoms bonded to the central atom, N is the number of lone or non-bonding pairs on the central atom only. So in the ABN notation, the B and the N may have a subscript after them to tell how many bonding and non-bonding um, regions you have. So if we look at water, H2O, this has two atoms bonded to the central atom. If you look at the Lewis dot structure, if you look at the Lewis dot structure, oxygen has two lone pairs on the central atom. 
So the ABN notation would be AB2N2 as a result. And this will affect what kind of shape we will pick out for water. Okay, so let's just go through the molecular shapes. So what I want to show you with this slide here is that um, we have here, if you have three bonding regions, you're going to have a trigonal planar shape. If you replace one of those bonding regions with a non-bonding region, you're going to have like a bent shape. If you have four bonding regions, we have a tetrahedral shape like our balloon with, um, with like our four balloons tied together. If we replace one of these bonds with a non-bonding region, this becomes what we call a trigonal pyramidal shape. If we replace two of them, it becomes a bent shape. Here we have five bonding regions. This is a trigonal bipyramidal shape like I showed you with the balloons. If we replace one of those bonds with a lone pair, this becomes more of a seesaw shape. If we replace two of the bonds with lone pairs, this becomes a T-shape. If we replace three of the bonds with lone pairs, this becomes a linear shape. The last two have five regions. First is um, excuse me, six regions. The first is six bonding regions. That's an octahedral shape like I showed you with the balloons. Here we also have six regions, but we replaced one of the bonding with a lone pair, and now we have a square pyramidal shape. Okay, so what I want to show you here is this reference sheet, which you should have in Google Classroom, that shows you these different shapes with the um, with the ABN notation and the angles. So this is similar to the slide I was showing you. Um, what you see here is in blue are the lone pairs. So the first shape we have here has two bonding regions off the central atom. The A is always the central atom on this sheet. B are going to be your things atoms bonded to it. So we have a 180 degree angle, and this is a linear structure. Here we have instead we have one um, bonding and one non-bonding region off of A. This is also going to be linear. The third one here has three bonding regions, three things bonded to A. This is going to be a trigonal planar shape with 120 degree angles. Here, we're replacing one of those bonding regions with a non-bonding region. The angles are going to be a little less than 120 degrees because that non-bonding region takes up more space. Here, we also have three regions, but now we have two non-bonding, one bonding. This is also going to be linear. Down here, we have four bonding regions. This is going to have a tetrahedral shape with 109.5 degree angles. And here we have a, um, a molecule with six regions. Two of them are non-bonding, four of them are bonding. This will be a square planar shape. Here we have something very similar to the tetrahedral, but we replaced one of the bonding regions with a non-bonding region. And you notice, compared to the tetrahedral, the bond angle is a little bit smaller. And that's what we call the trigonal pyramidal shape. Here we have four regions, but two of them are now non-bonding. And you notice the angle is going to be even smaller, and it's a bent shape. The last one on the left-hand side has three non-bonding, one bonding. This is going to be linear, just like some of the ones at the top. On the right-hand side, we now have five regions. This is going to be a trigonal pyramidal shape with a, um, two bond angles. One of them is going to be 90 degrees. 
that's going to be between the ones above and below the plane and those atoms that are on the plane. And the other one's 120, which is going to be the angle we'll see between the, um, the atoms that are on that trigonal plane in the middle. The next one has replaced one of these bonding with a non-bonding. And all those angles we saw above are a little bit smaller as a result. The T-shape has replaced another bonding with non-bonding. And again, the angles will be even smaller. And then this, this linear shape has replaced another bonding with non-bonding. And now we have a linear shape. And then the next one has six regions, all of them bonding. That's going to be octahedral. If we replace one of those six regions with a non-bonding, we see that this shape has now changed the square pyramidal. And the angles are a little bit smaller. If we replace two of those bonding with a non-bonding, um, we get a square planar shape with 90 degree angles. Okay, so these are the different shapes, and now we're going to practice figuring out which shape we have using the, the, like I said, the Lewis dot structure worksheet, which you worked on last night, which we went over at the beginning of class. So I'm going to pull that up. Okay, so let's practice on this sheet. So I'm going to show you how to take these Lewis dot structures that you've drawn and come up with a, um, the shape for them. So what you're going to be writing is the ABN notation for each of these molecules. Now, if we look at the first methane, we have C is our central atom, so that's our A. So I'm going to write down A, and you will always have just one A. You should never have a subscript with the A. We have four things bonded to it, so we have four hydrogens. So this will be AB4. You notice there are no lone pairs on carbon. And then if we look at our, sh our shape sheet, what we see is that we're going to look for AB4. Here it is. And that's a tetrahedral shape. So we're going to go back to this sheet and write down this is tetrahedral. We look at the second one. Here we have water. Oxygen is our A. We have two hydrogens bonded to it, so it's AB2. And then two lone pairs. So I'm going to put little, looks like Mickey Mouse ears. These are two lone pairs. So we're counting pairs of electrons, not single electrons. So it'd be AB2N2. If we go to our shape sheet, we're going to look for AB2 into, so we have to go down, I think, a little bit, and that is going to be here, that's going to be bent. If we go to the next one, we have carbon as our central atom, that's our A. We have two things bonded to it, two oxygens is B2. We only focus on this, the lone pairs on carbon, and carbon does not have any lone pairs. And if you look at your shape sheet, AB2 is going to be linear. That's here at the top. So we're going to put down linear. Now, if you, whenever you have just two atoms, this is always going to be linear. And if you look at all the different scenarios on the shape sheet with just two atoms, you're going to see that they're always linear. This one's linear. Um, we have down here, this one's linear. So that's always going to be linear. Okay, now if we look at the next one, we have beryllium. That's our A. We have two chlorines bonded to it. That's our B2. And again, we look for lone pairs on beryllium. There are no lone pairs in beryllium, so it's just AB2 that's also linear. Okay, now I want to show you one that's asymmetrical. So let's go down here, 
and let's look at H2CO2, so this one here. So when you have a situation like this, you're going to do a geometry around each central atom. So we have carbon. Carbon is bonded to hydrogen, oxygen, and oxygen. So we have A, B, 3. We don't have any lone pairs in that carbon, and that's going to be trigonal planar. Then we look at the oxygen there. The oxygen has two things bonded to it. So the oxygen is going to be A, B2. And we have two lone pairs in the oxygen, so it's going to be N2. And if we look at our shape sheet, we see that's bent. So we have two geometries here. We're going to have trigonal, planar, and bent. So to remember, in each case, oxygen is bonded to carbon and hydrogen. That counts as our B2 and two lone pairs. In the case of carbon, it's bonded to hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen. So you're going to have to do that in situations like with ethane, ethene. Just remember to do that. Okay, so let's do an, um, one last one on here before you guys practice using one with an expanded octet. So if we look at the bottom right-hand corner, we have bromine pentafluoride. Here, bromine would be our A, and it's bonded to five different atoms, so AB5. And we have one lone pair, so it'd be AB5N. And if we go to our shape sheet, we could find AB5N. That's going to be a square pyramidal structure. So we're going to write down square, pyramidal. Okay, guys, so I want you to try some of these on your own. And just let me know if you have any questions.